I hear you. Ron hears you. All right, very good. And the first slide is coming up. Okay. All right, here we go. Thank you very, very much for, for having all of us uh, present to you today uh, regarding the mummies of Guanajuato, their role in the past, present, and future. Um, as you can see, next slide, we'll be presenting this in three separate presentations. The first one I'll be doing, um, this is Ron Beckett, of course, is the rationale for and the methods of research on mummified remains. Jerry, Dr. Conlon will be looking at the journey of imaging the past, particularly looking at the Guanajuato collection and all the work that we've done over the, oh my goodness, past almost uh, almost 20 years now. And then finally, Andrew will be finishing up with, with some information about looking at the analysis of the mummified remains and the models for uh, knowledge mobilization. I'd like to start off with a rationale for why we study uh, mummified remains in the first place. Next slide. As, you, as you're probably aware, <clears throat> a lot of the cultures that uh, we study, particularly ancient ones, non-historic cultures, um, uh, have no written histories. And so clearly people who are interested and curious are, are very, uh, want to study them and want to learn about them. But more importantly, every time we try to study mummies, very often I should say, there are... Um, impediments. There are, are waqueros who, who grave rob. They're looking for, as you see on the screen, artifacts and textiles and, and bags. And what they do with the human remains, next slide, next, is slowly, is just put the human remains out on the surface. And this really destroys all that we can learn uh, from these people who have no written history necessarily. So, and it's not just the textiles and the artifacts, next slide, but it's also mummies themselves have found their way to the black market. Um, they are, are sold even on eBay on occasion. Uh, governments and, 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 and police departments try to, uh, to police this problem, but it, it, it persists even today, very, very recently. So the rationale then Next slide, please. Is to try to rescue these cultures. Uh, again, as I say, these pre cultures predate historic records. And if it's to be preserved, it, it has to be protected. If the culture is to be protected, it needs to be studied respectfully so that we return uh, the voice, if you will, of these ancient cultures to those peoples who were involved with it. Our preferred method of study is non-destructive data collection, and that preserves the context and uh, it provides a considerable amount of, of analyzable data to help us understand those lives from these ancient cultures. Next slide, please. So we can look at how they lived by studying them, how they interacted with an impact on, uh, and the impact of their environment on them, what diseases they may have had, so what we're trying to create are very human stories about these ancient people or even historic people like the Guanajuato mummies. We're trying to return to them their life stories so that they can retain their place in the continuum of humankind's history on Earth. Next slide, please. We also need to look at why people mummified in, uh, in the past. Uh, and quite frankly, in the present as well. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, this most of this comes from Dr. Alfred, uh, excuse me, Dr. Heidi, uh, in his book, The Scientific Study of Mummies. And for our purposes, we're going to break mummification into two broad categories: intentional anthropogenic mummification. That means they made them on purpose, and unintentional means they happened because as a result of their environment. First. The intentional mummies, there are several reasons why they have been created. One, and we're probably most familiar with, is the enhancement of royal authority, like the Egyptians and the Inca, status or security for war trophies, 
And what an interesting one is regulation of the spiritual force of the deceased, like the Chinchuro and the Anga of Papua New Guinea and Aleuts. But sadly, there is also another reason why people uh, intentionally mummified, and that's a more modern reason, and that's for entertainment, like carnival show, uh, carnival sideshow mummies. Next slide, please. We'll go through these quickly. Uh, we'll go through these quickly because I think you're familiar with, with uh, Egyptian mummies and their relationship to both status, uh, royalty, and preserving the line of governing. The upper right image is a model of an Inca mummy who is being paraded through town. This is a reenactment, of course. And it was an intent for the Inca governing powers to suggest to the population that their their chain of rulership is continuing until they sorted out who was going to be in charge next. The next slide, please. The uh, spiritual connection reason for mummifying is, is perhaps one of the most fascinating and, and certainly one of the more human reasons. The upper left picture is a image of a chinchuro mummy. As some of you know, this was a uh, somewhat of a nomadic population in what's now northern Chile and southern Peru. They mummified all strata, all levels of their society. Uh, there's evidence that they repaired the mummies, that they traveled with the mummies. So they're keeping a connection with who that individual was. The bottom left-hand picture is Lang Po Deng, a self-mummified Buddhist monk. Uh, he went through an elaborate process to mummify himself, clearly uh, uh, fully dehydrated, but it was very intentional with the purpose of demonstrating uh, the power of the Buddhist constructs of our ability to overcome the pains and discomforts of human life. And finally, on the bottom right is a gentleman whose name, uh, the mummy in the center, his name is Moimango. This is a very modern mummification. Uh, in fact, the gentleman bending down is his son, Gimtasu, who is now also a mummy, even today, living and in, interacting with their culture. So they still maintain that spiritual connection. Next slide, please. And one of the last purposes we talked about was entertainment, taking mummies on the sideshow. As the world became smaller and people became aware of Egyptian mummies, mummies were very popular. So people wanted to see mummies and people made a good uh, income by showing mummies in the sideshow circuit. It's kind of a sad tale, but it is one that must be uh, included in the intentional mummification uh, classification. Next slide, please. Now, unintentional mummies are really interesting. Uh, the bog bodies of, of, of Northern Europe and, and Ireland and Scotland, uh, some crypt mummies like the ones in Guanajuato there and other locations. Um, these are mummies that are made by the environment. Let's look at a few of those now. Next slide, please. The first one on the upper left is a bog body. The buried in it uh, for whatever, not even buried, sometimes just thrown in a, into a bog. We don't know the in, entire reasons behind why, why people were put into a bog, but nonetheless, it was the environment of the bog. They didn't intend to make mummies. It took years and years and years for the individual to be mummified. And in the bog being an acidic environment, the bones decalcify and pretty much disappear. What's left are the soft tissues. On the top right, of course, are the mummies of Guanajuato. These were produced by the crypt environment. Uh, there in Guanajuato, the dry, high air and the climate produced those mummies. The bottom right, is a mummy buried in the sands of the desert island Ilsa San Lorenzo off the port of Callao in Lima, Peru. And anybody who was buried in those sands were rapidly desiccated, leaving mummified human remains. Again, unintentionally. They did not intend to make this mummy. The last one on the bottom left is the soap lady. She was buried or in a condition of where the sands or the soil was alkaline and it in particular was ash and that mixed with the fats of her body turning the fats into what we call adipocere or a waxy like substance and 
She is, uh, she is, as you can see, pretty well preserved in, in her state there in, um, in Philadelphia at the Mütter Museum. Now, aside from intentional mummies, uh, unintentional mummies, there's one classification of intentional mummies I've left out. If you go to the next slide, please. And that is fakes and frauds. As you can see, this looks like an Egyptian baboon mummy. This is at the Rosicrucian Egyptian Museum in San Jose, California. But my colleague Jerry Conlog radiographed this wonderful artifact that they purchased for a good amount of money in the early 1900s. And what he found was on the next slide. It wasn't a mummy at all. It was a fake. The museum, so there was an entire industry of intentional fraudulent mummification. They even would do this to, to, to uh, people. And that kind of relates to the to human beings. That kind of relates back to the sideshow and carnival mummies. So now we know that the reasons why some mummies were made, both intentionally and unintentionally. And I think you're aware, next slide, please, of how they're displayed um, uh, from, from around the world. And um, we won't spend much time on this, but it's important to note that the, how mummies are displayed is determined by the reasons why they want to display them. The primary reason is educational, like in museums and academic institutions. Another reason is the spiritual connection. Uh, for example, crypt mummies or clergy. These aren't designed to be museums or academic or educational, but because they had some sort of a spiritual purpose on earth, like priests. Another intent for exhibition is traveling exhibits. And finally, some mummies are still to this day, because of the spiritual connection with the living population, interred in uh, their original context. If you go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Yes. And here are some examples. Obviously, museums on the top left, uh, crypt mummies in Ganji, Sicily. These were priests who were uh, mummified and, and put in upright uh, uh, alcoves uh, to honor them. Traveling exhibits in the bottom left, like the Mummies of the World, the Traveling Exhibition. That's a whole other topic that we can get into. And mummies that are still in the original context on the far right. This is that same mummy we saw in the earlier picture, Moy Mongo. He sits on a cliff with a lot of his relatives looking down over the village of Koke, spiritually, if you will, protecting the village from harm. Uh, also locating, uh, uh, establishing a location for that tribe and their claim to land. These mummies are still an active part of, of their culture today. And as I mentioned, the son of this particular mummy is now mummified by their method, the smoke body method, and sits with his father overlooking and protecting the village. Andrew and I were quite involved with that, uh, with that, um, that project of restoring that mummy and understanding them better. So now again, we generally know, and I think that is, is some general information that you probably already know about how mummies are, are um, uh, displayed. What I'd like to know, uh, what I'd like to present now is a continuation of our rationale of mummy studies. If you go to the next slide, please. Our big question is what can we learn from mummies? And you could read the slide here, but we can derive a variety of cultural practices. Next slide, please. Medical practices like trepanation. As you can see, the two skulls on the outside, this is an Inca, uh, Inca skulls in uh, Cusco, Peru, show signs of trepanation an intentional opening into the skull to relieve pressure. We're not sure exactly why or relieve spirits. Likely it was for intense headaches or from an, an injury uh, uh, that occurred during warfare. But as you can see, the one on the right and the left, the openings into the skull are in fact somewhat healed. And the one in the center, I'm not sure if you can see it on the slide, but you can see the little cupping, the little carvings into the skull. That particular individual, uh, he didn't have time. He didn't live long enough to be healed. That doesn't mean the trepanation killed him. It could mean the underlying condition that they were trying to treat, in fact, killed him. On the picture on the right, in the same location, this individual mummy had an opening or a wound in the back of his skull, about in the location of a very large trepanation. 
And fortunately in the museum there, they also had Inca warfare artifacts. And as you can see, the implement in the center was likely the tool or the ax head that actually inflicted the wound in this mummy's head. More artifact analysis, next slide, can give us even more information. The slide on the far left, uh, associated artifact here, we see a spondylus shell. We uh, know that supposedly that was the food of the gods, so it may some say something about the status of that individual. And then we can look at body modifications. Uh, in this example, there's a, a, uh, a cranial, uh, intentional cranial modification of an infant. This is down in uh, Chiribaya culture the, in uh, near Ilo, Peru. And as you can see, the elongated skull, it, it, we don't know exactly why they do that, but it, it's, uh, and it, 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 it could be for cosmetic reasons or it could be for, for other reasons in, indeed. In fact, uh, if any of you watch Indiana Jones, uh, the movie The Crystal Skull, you, you have your answer. It was clearly because aliens came, came to Earth uh, and, and taught us how to farm. The two little pictures on the far right are endoscopic images of the inside of that skull. Dr. Sonia Guillen, uh, a noted bioarchaeologist in Peru, suggested that might be remnants of blood that may be related to the intentional cranial modification that maybe was uh, part of the reason this child didn't live longer than it did. Next slide, please. And in this slide, it's just again, more uh, funer uh, funerary or burial inclusions. Uh, this side view of the mummy here labeled with an A uh, points to all the cotton packing. Uh, inside the mummy bundle, there's, uh, you can see a metal binding, it looks like metal ribbon that went around a scepter of sorts. This uh, C is a, a pincher or something the individual used to, to, to shave with, to pull whiskers with. And perhaps these were included to be used in their concept of the afterlife or included simply because they were dear to that individual and represented aspects of their life. Next slide, please. We can also learn, uh, as we've talked about some burial practices, social organization, uh, information about the diet and disease, paleodemography, population movement. Uh, next slide, please. Obviously, some of the anthropological questions can be answered, the sex of the individual, the age at time of death, uh, the dental health, as we talked about already, uh, medical practices, sometimes diseases. We're going to be talking about diseases, paleopathologies in a second. And of course, we mentioned artifact analysis. Okay, now that we know what we can learn, and as you can see, it's quite a bit we can begin to paint a picture of an individual. And if we have a lot of mummies, mummies we can uh, un begin to under better understand their lived experience, their life and their entire culture. But how do we get this information? Next slide, please. So we collect information in two main ways. We call them non-destructive analysis. And on the next slide, you'll see destructive analysis. But first of all, non-destructive uh, encompasses looking at the object, looking at the total context. Photography, very techniques of to, uh, to, uh, photography. Um, uh, Miguel and, and his team can certainly talk to you about the, the uh, many techniques that they use to photograph and help us understand populations of the past through their projects with us and in other places. Uh, conventional radiography, which Jerry will be addressing quite a bit. Um, video endoscopy, uh, XRF is, is an, uh, X-ray fluorescence, which gives us elemental analysis. For example, uh, some mummies were made with an arsenic solution. So if we can use this device without having to take a scraping that will tell us that if arsenic was in fact on the surface of that body. And then we can also use advanced imaging, CR, which is also uh, DR, digital radiography, digital imaging, CT, as you know, CT scans, magnetic resonance, uh, imaging, and there are others as well, like micro CTs and a variety of additional non-destructive analysis methodologies that we can apply. Next slide, please. Yes, the destructive analysis. Now, uh, when it's dictated by the case, samples can be taken. Now, we do 
prefer to take what we call micro samples, smallest sample possible. It can be the tissues, copper lights, bone, hair, teeth. A full autopsy can be done, but that's typically avoided. Uh, we're looking for uh, DNA. We're looking for histology. Uh, we're looking for, for what the pathology is. Uh, we can look at chemistry of, of a lesion. We can look at artifacts that have been interred within the body and look at their chemical makeup as well. Now, all these methods, uh, as, as you've seen, both non-destructive and destructive need to be used in a complementary manner. Next slide, please. So briefly, I want to just show you a, a case in, uh, that exemplifies the complementary nature of these analytical methods. First of all, we need to explore the context. This is a church in Popoli, Italy. And it's only used now for um, weddings and celebrations, but they were redoing the floor beneath this crypt, beneath this floorboards, there's a crypt and in the crypt were mummified remains, accidentally mummified by the conditions. The, the, the context, the conditions included a limestone, um, um, limestone crypt. And I'm not sure if you can see on this slide, not only just the photograph of all of these and the importance of the photograph is, is, is it can't be over understated, the robing, the clothes that are on this individual are quite nice. They're not that of a priest. You would think that there would be a priest or a clergy buried in the church, but because of the photograph and we can get macro photography, we can look at the fine nature of the clothing and make other suppositions. For example, this individual, likely not a priest, but he was someone that was well-to-do that was important to the church. So we've looked at observation and photography. And again, all this is very brief. Next slide, please. Our paleopathologist uh, who is uh, spearheading the study, Dr. Gino Fernacciari from Italy, wanted to take some tissue samples of the lungs. So again, we're getting the smallest sample possible using the endoscope. So now we've used observation, photography, and endoscopy. We've collected a sample. So we've, collect, we've slipped over to the destructive side. The micro sample did yield some muscle fibers with some calcifications and some fungal spores. So the pathologist was able to do some histological analysis. Next slide, please. Radiography was extremely important for many reasons in this case, but one I'd like to point out is it demonstrated evidence of a probable renal stone. We were able to CT scan this mummy to confirm the uh, position of the renal stone. Next slide. Back at the church, we were able to use a technique that Jerry invented for localizing in a uh, two-dimensional image where an object is in a spatial relationship to other objects, which allowed the endoscope to find this potential renal stone and excise it from the body. Next slide. And now the renal stone could be examined for its, morph for its morphological features and its chemical makeup and the pathology. So next slide just ties this all together. We used all these methods to complement one another to lead that case forward to help us try to understand who that person may have been, uh, what their status may have been in terms of the clothing, uh, 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 which was enhanced by our ability to study radiographs after the fact and distribute those radio fact, uh, radiographs, also to determine the condition of health of this individual. Again, we learned a lot more about this person, but for the sakes of our presentation, uh, we're trying to keep it brief just to set them in as examples. Now, we've talked about how, what we can learn. We demonstrate a little bit about what we can learn, how we can learn it, which are the techniques and the methods. Now, what do we do with that information? We try and interpret it, but we need to interpret it with what we've called the diagnosis, next slide, please, the diagnosis by consensus approach. If just an anthropologist looks at an object or a radiograph, uh, they will see it through their lens, through their view of, okay, there's a lesion there, uh, a, a disease process, maybe the teeth are worn, whatever that might be. Uh, they're this old when they died based on arthritic changes and, and tying that in with the entire context as the bio, bioarchaeological model does. Now, 
if physicians become involved, like a radiologist, they will make medical interpretations. But sometimes those medical interpretations are made out of context. They're made based upon their real life experience in modern times. And it's not um, adjusted for the original context or the original uh, uh, period of time in which the mummy lived and died. So if we just look at the medical interpretation, they may suggest, and I have some examples of this in a moment, that it's X uh, or, or certain disease or problem, whereas the bioarchaeologist and bioanthropologist realize that that's probably inaccurate because of the context. So when we work together and try and come to using different lenses and discussion and educate one another, we can question our assumptions and come up with a more informed diagnosis. And we call that diagnosis by consensus. Next slide, please. Just to re, uh, reiterate, if we make a diagnosis in a vacuum, the first point there, it, we, it, it's, it's uninformed. We need to include the bioanthropologist, the radiologist, and other medical specialists as well. But what's really important is in the third bullet point here, the disordered target standard, disordered targeted standards. By this, we mean collecting the data is as important as interpreting the data. Without good information, without a good radiographic image, for example, or advanced imaging, or biopsy, whatever it is, our, our interpretations can't be as accurate. So we need to have the standards uh, of, of, of data acquisition up in, uh, in the forefront so that we can get the information so that other people can look at these collectively, rigorously interpret the information based on what we think we're seeing, what we know about the context from the or bioarchaeologist and what the medical folks can, can contribute, medical practitioners. And oops, sorry, and ground truthing is a, a, a wonderful way to, it, it, it's all about standards, is trying to assure that what we think we're seeing in a medical image or in a digital image is what we think it is. So ideally, we will find it, we will make our diagnosis by consensus interpretation and then take a micro sample or apply advanced imaging to that lesion and correct our assumptions or biases. And that's ground truthing. Are we seeing what we think we're seeing? Next slide, please. So basically this summarizes the diagnostics uh, by, by consensus approach. We have to have personnel to collect the data in the first box there. Uh, we have to know the context. We have to have people who can collect the quality images. So people must be experienced with imaging dry desiccated human remains and artifacts. We need to know how to target specific uh, to, to, to image specific targets within the body. And we need to determine then if advanced imaging is in fact required. Once we've got the data collection, we need to interpret it. Who is going to do it? We've talked about the bioanthropologist. We've talked about medical personnel, uh, radiologists. There's even more that can be uh, added to that list as you'll see in the next uh, topic that's coming up. Uh, what's the experience level? Do, do, does the radiologist know how to read an x-ray of a body that isn't fluid filled, a body that cannot give you signs or symptoms like a medical physician would usually have? What's their training? What's their bias? When considering all of these boxes, one and two, we can finally make an informed diagnosis. Now, Andrew later is going to be talking in great detail about archiving and sharing this information so we can even get more views and more interpretations and more comparisons, which will give us ultimately on the far right, a greater understanding of the lived experience of ancient cultures. So they become no longer a curiosity, but an, an answer to questions about humankind's journey uh, through time on Earth. Now, a few examples of why diagnosis by consensus is important. A few brief case examples. Next slide, please. The first one, we took an X-ray of an Egyptian mummy at the Barnum 
uh, museum. In fact, well, this is a CT scan, obviously. And you can see there's a large object in the body. The general gray at the bottom end of the picture inside the body, this is a, a, axial, a cross section, is, uh, is resin. But this large object here was interpreted by a radiologist to be a bird mummy that was packed inside a human mummy. Well, upon further examination, we saw no bird bones. Well, let me take a step back. The bird mummy within a human mummy story, of course, is what hit the newspapers and the media and it became somewhat sensationalistic. However, upon better examination and understanding not only mummification practices, that then there were no bird bones inside this packet, it was determined that the more likely explanation probable explanation uh, uh, with information contributed by bioarchaeological and context experts that this is probably an organ packet. As we know, Egyptians moved organs. It seems, if you've read about mummies at all, it seems a logical explanation uh, to you, I hope. But the physician who was unfamiliar with Egyptian mummification and organ treatment suggested that it was a bird. Next slide, please. Next case, we called in an, a pediatric orthopedist to look at this child mummy from the Greco-Roman period. This is the Yale Peabody Museum in New Haven. And we noticed a fractured right forearm. So he immediately says that this was evidence of child abuse because in modern times, a fracture like that is what he might see in child abuse in a modern city. Next slide, please. However, on further examination, the left X-ray shows, or excuse me, CT scan section shows that interrupted radial cortex on the, on the uh, uh, forearm bone of this child, but it also shows torn wrappings. Next slide, please. So this likely was not child abuse. This child mummy came from Egypt. It was probably traveled out of uh, its, its its location by a beast of burden like a camel or a donkey and then came on a, a boat or an airplane and then was handled in the collection rooms in the museums. So the most likely explanation is that this, it, to, to make a broad claim that there was child abuse it, is kind of an abuse of logic. The most logical explanation is that it was evidence of a post-mortem fracture. And the final case, next slide please is uh, very straightforward. Another radiologist familiar with inner, um, with large city um, uh, issues and health problems suggested that these lines in the bones and the brackets that you see in the, in the x-ray, these lines suggested that they were evidence of lead poisoning, that a child must have ingested small lead paint chips. When in fact, if we contextualize this information, there probably wasn't, uh, weren't a lot of lead paint chips around, and more likely, these are generalized Harris's growth arrest lines, which can be produced by uh, seasonal disease patterns, by uh, environmental stress like uh, malnutrition, and 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 so on. So, I think you can see from these three cases the importance of diagnosis by consensus. As we continue to bring anthropology, bioarchaeology, and medical practices together, each discipline, particularly on the medical side of the house, really needs to understand the, the contextual information and what potentially was going on from the, in the archaeological record with these populations. Next slide, please. At the heart of all of this is to try and understand what a person felt like what they when they lived what was their lived experience and that brings in the bioarchaeology of care model we've put, spent, spent quite a bit of time at talking about identifying paleopathology that was the diagnosis by consensus but now what we take that a step further what did that person experience what did that disease process or pathology uh uh how did that impact their function, their ability to function in their environment and in their society? So we have to understand not only the pathology, but as you'll see, the pathophysiology and therefore imply functional limitations and 
understand if there was evidence of care. And once again, the context is key. We have to ask what could be done, what did they have, and what would be done? Did the culture, is there evidence that this person lived a nice long lifespan with a disease process that required care? And that would be the bioarchaeology of care. Next slide, please. And this simplified model, as, as you can see at the top, we've talked about paleopathology quite a bit, diagnosis by consensus. Now, in pathophysiology, this is what the disease does to the body as the person continues to live. So does it destroy tissue? Does it uh, uh, make it hard or difficult to move like an arthritis? Then what would those anatomical or physiological variations do to the individual's ability to function? And finally, are the potential patterns of care? that would help the increase or improve the function of that individual. And to elucidate this, to illustrate this, next slide, please. Here's another brief case example. And then we'll turn this over to Jerry. Um, in this case, we won't go into great detail. Next slide, please. Thank you. Of, of the nature of this particular mummy, it's a modern mummy, uh, late 1800s, um, and it was mummified using a, a very special and novel solution at the time. However, important to our discussion is that these two x-rays, in the first x-ray, we saw a tremendous lesion there in the chest that you can see. We took a biopsy of that lesion and took another x-ray. Next slide, please. We had it histologically analyzed in looking at the center we, uh, we find that this person had, this was lung tissue. We find that they had emphysema and something called anthracosis, which you acquire uh, by inhaling coal dust for a long period of time. Next slide, please. So what we've talked about so far is coming up with a diagnosis. By consensus, I just want to drive this home. You, we used radiography, endoscopy. Uh, ethnographic data collection and a biopsy, a radiologist familiar with the um, with mummified remains gave us a radiographic uh, estimation of the disease process. Bioanthropologist gave us a historical and regional context. A paleopathologist gave us a histological analysis that helped us come to a diagnosis of severe emphysema with moderate to mark anthracosis. Now, if we go back to our model, next slide, please. We are at the pathology section by uh, the uh, level here by diagnosed by consensus. But what does severe, and we're going to focus on emphysema, not so much anthracosis at this time, because there were two diseases. But what is the pathophysiology of, of emphysema? Basically, air sacs are destroyed. Uh, the body has a tendency not to be able to exhale. The ability to get oxygen in the body and particularly carbon dioxide out of the body is impaired. So you can imagine that leads to functional limitations. So let's look at some of those functional limitations and ultimately the pattern of care. Next slide, please. I apologize that this chart is in English, but it looks at what's called activities of daily living. People with severe emphysema, or which is a part of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, rated activities in their modern living. Now, these activities of daily living, vacuum cleaning, all the way down to peeling potatoes, and said how hard that was for them or what brought on dyspnea. Obviously, the more energy required to do an activity, uh, the, great, the more difficult it would be for an individual with emphysema to do that activity. Now, in an ancient culture, from the archaeological uh, analysis, if it was an agrarian society, like uh, cultivating this soil, would be a very challenging activity of daily living where, where uh, washing or, or weaving may be somewhere in the middle, uh, washing, your, your taking care of your, yourself, your teeth or your hair may be very easy to do. So now we get some idea on what's difficult and what isn't difficult for this individual that we're talking about in this case who had severe emphysema. Next slide, please. And we would find that in the chronic state, in other words, in the balanced state, they don't, they're not uh, acutely ill at this time, they would need little or no assistance with basic activities of daily living, 
but they would probably need assistance with what's called instrumental activities of daily living, which mean those more advanced uh, 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 activities that they would need to do to be part of the society, carrying, carrying a load, carrying a uh, uh, Firm or, or objects back or, or, or caring for, for animals, whatever that ancient culture taught us. However, in acute exacerbations, they would need, in other words, when the, when the person is, um, is sick or has a cold or, or, or pneumonia on top of their emphysema, they would need assistance with both the basic and the instrumental activities of daily living. And they, if whatever medical interventions were available based on the archaeological record, those would probably be required as well. So, next slide, please. In summary of the um, bioarchaeology bio of care, and, and, and I think you can see by now, if we, we must, if we study mummies, we have to collect the information appropriately. We have to interpret appropriately. And now we have to make uh, an understanding of what that meant to those people as they lived. And only in that way can we truly get a largest picture possible of how a culture interacted with their environment and had their, their experience So uh, here on Earth. So we always need the contextual ex experts, bioarchaeology, bioanthropology, paleopathology. We also need to consider medical experts, but those beyond just the radiologist, those who in fact dealt with uh, the diseases that were discovered through the diagnostic uh, by consensus model. And then what were the ADLs that they required and what were the societal roles? And in trying to determine their functionality within their culture, we need, might need to call in an orthopedic individual, a, a, a pulmonologist for lung disorders, rheumatologists for arthritic conditions that will inform us of what we know about those conditions and how they impact in individuals. Cardiologists, uh, beyond the physicians, we would look at physical therapists, occupational therapists, respiratory therapists, registered nurses, and so on to help us understand the lived condition. And when we're looking at bioarchaeology, bioarchaeology of care in particular, we need to consider both of them, never one without the other. We must have the context, and we must have those who are familiar with, in, even in the living populations, what it would be like to live with that condition. All right, last slide. Next slide, please. All right, we've covered quite a bit, and this is a summary of what we've talked about so far. And hopefully, collectively, it's given you a, a, a good understanding of why we study mummies, how we study mummies, and what we can learn. So it establishes a strong rationale for studying mummies that are in museums, that are in their original context, that are in uh, uh, a crypt in Italy or wherever it might be, or in a cave in Peru. And uh, we've, we've hopefully driven home the point of how much we can learn, how much we can potentially rebuild the uh, our, and, and enhance our understanding of past cultures. With that, next slide, please. I would like to thank you very much. And up next, of course, is my colleague Jerry Conlog, and he'll present uh, El Viaje para Imaginar el Pasado, Revelando los secretos, secretos de las Momias. Lo siento. Muchas gracias. Can you hear me? Gotcha. Thank you. I certainly do. Okay, sounds good. Buenos dias. Uh, actually, buenos tardes. Um, today, we're going to take a journey 
And for Ron and I, this has been a journey that's gone over almost two decades of looking at mummies in Guanajuato. Next slide. Uh, it, it's truly an honor to be asked to speak about our work. However, because of my inability to speak Spanish, I've included translations on the following slides, and I hope the translations are acceptable. Next slide. In 2001, Ron and I were asked if we would like to host a program on the National Geographic Channel going around the world x-raying mummies. We did 40 episodes. We visited 130 countries. It was translated into 60 languages. And part of this program was entertainment. We were trying to bring science, but there's a little entertainment involved also. Next slide. So, we were, I was equipped with an x-ray unit that was from the 1950s. Because it was low energy, it required at least 15 seconds exposure for us to get an acceptable radiograph. We were limited to equipment that was used in the hospital and donated for our purposes. So we had x-ray cassettes and x-ray film. Next slide. But there's a problem in using x-ray film. We need a dark room. And our first visit to Guanajuato in 2001, the only place we found for a dark room was actually the stairway that leads from the museum up to the graveyard. So that was the dark room. Next slide. But a bigger problem, human x-ray film, film used in hospitals, has a very narrow, what's called latitude. A very narrow range of expo exposures are acceptable. But for people in the hospital, their tissue is hydrated. They're about 70, 80% water. So it's not much of a problem. Next slide. This is what we were faced in 2001 in the old museum. Bodies were in one of two positions, either horizontally, in these cabinets, or you'll see in another slide a little later, they were in a vertical position. Next slide. We had our old x-ray unit and we had to use whatever was available in the museum to get things at the right height. So, and this was part of the entertainment of the episode, how we solve problems and they wanted to see us do this. So we used a stepladder, Ron's there documenting photographs. And this is how we took the x-rays in 2001. Next slide. But here's the problem with using this film. This is one of the angelitos. And you can see that the x-ray film is really dark. It's really very black. There is very few shades of gray because there's no water in this tissue. These are totally dehydrated bodies. We can see the bones a little bit, but we can't see any soft tissue. You can see metal. You can see the metal from the rosary beads, the metal from the wire that's holding the broom together. And you can see two safety pins at the neck of, of this infant, but we can't see soft tissue. These x-rays would certainly not be acceptable for a radiologist to make a broad interpretation of what's on the film. Next slide. But beginning in the 1990s and my work with mummies, I started using other kinds of film. And this is Polaroid photographic film. It's a positive image instead of a negative image that we see on the radiographs, but it provides excellent detail. A drawback is these exposures might take a half a minute at least. They needed more exposure. But here we can see detail. There's actually remnants of brain in the base of the skull, and we can see the, the infant's liver. So there was soft tissue within this infant that we could not have seen on regular x-ray film. Next slide. This is the other way mummies were presented. This mummy was in an upright position, 
So I had to use aluminum tubing to hold up the x-ray plate. We balanced the x-ray plate on some aluminum bars. And that's how I got the x-ray of the individual's legs. But again, I can see the bone, but I can't see any soft tissue. So once again, poor contrast, hardly any shades of gray. It's either black or white, narrow latitude. Next slide. So what did we get out of this uh, examination of mummies in 2001? Next slide. We looked at some of the ones that are considered more famous, and this is MM15 Gracia, or the strangled one. And uh, they said she was strangled because of the marks on her neck. A lot of the mummies that were exhibited in 2001 had fantastic sensational stories and this is one great example here now those marks on her neck could have been from a necklace she had on or some other soft material that was around her neck but it left an impression next slide the polaroid images show that she had no fractures of her cervical spine or hyoid bone something that you would see possibly in a strangulation but more importantly, Ron's endoscope showed that the airway was perfectly open, not compressed at all. So this individual was not hanged. Next slide. So in 2001, in three days, we x-rayed 18 mummies. <clears throat> we took 42 x-rays, and that comes out to an average of 14 x-rays a day. Next slide. In 2007, we came back to a new museum. It was beautiful. It was fantastic. Next slide. And they were now prepared to have the mummies studied more formally. They actually built structures where the mummies can be placed uh, so I could x-ray them. And we also had an anthropologist from the University of North Texas, Jerry Millaby, with us. So he did the anthropological examination. I collected the x-rays. The x-rays went back to the States, and they were viewed by a radiologist. So it was a combination of a radiologist making their interpretations from the images I acquired and Jerry Melby putting everything into anthropological context or historical context. This is a diagnosis by consensus at work that Ron pointed out to you. Next slide. <clears throat> I had a student with me, Jazzy Lee. Ron is there with, with Kathy Beckett, and she helped him with uh, the endoscopy. So we were doing endoscopy and radiography, plus having an anthropologist uh, also examine the remains. Next slide. What is probably most different about 2007, we brought only Polaroid film with us, and we had a new x-ray unit. The brand new x-ray unit could take exposures in 1 60th of a second or less, very quick time, and it was high energy output. With the Polaroid film and this x-ray unit, we were able to get much better images. Next slide. So we're going to get great latitude with these images, but there's a problem. The Polaroid film is small, much smaller than the regular X-ray film. But probably more important, the Polaroid film costs $14 per sheet, and the medical X-ray film was only a dollar a sheet. So this is going to be a very expensive exercise for us to collect images here. Next slide. But we were rewarded with fantastic images. Here are the growth of rest lines that Ron pointed out before uh, on this infant. We determined that this individual was three to five years old at the time of death. Again, one of the things that we look for is the age at the time of death. We could never have seen these growth of rest lines on conventional radiographic film back in, in 2001. The other thing that's important here, we can see soft tissue. And this individual is not emaciated. It's not really skinny. 
So it probably died of something that was very sudden. It didn't take weeks to die. It could have died just in a few days. Next slide. Next. Also, oh, back up. Okay. On MH7, we determined that this male was about 40 years old at the time of death. And what we saw on the Polaroid film at the base of the pelvis, it looks like there's a fracture. But we need another radiograph. And this works important to have a radiographer, someone who's trained in taking x-rays of live human beings to know how to reposition this individual to demonstrate the fracture. Next slide. So with the help of Jazzy, I rotated this mummy 35 degrees. We took the shot and you can see that there's a clear fracture of the ischium and the pubic bone. So we've determined conclusively that there's a fracture on this individual. Next slide. So in 2007, we examined 19 mummies in three days. We took 179 shots and we took so many more shots because it took more x-rays to cover an entire body than it would with regular x-ray film but we were able to shoot 60 films a day. And this is really important. We're only gonna be there for a short time. We want to maximize the amount of information that we can get for each day that we're working there. Next slide. In 2008, again, we returned to the museum, but unfortunately we didn't have Polaroid film at this time and we had to use regular X-ray film. Next slide. Ron is back to do the endoscopy with Kathy. Michael Olson was with me to help out in the examination. And once again, Jazzy Lee came back to help with the x-rays. And you can see with the, the benches built by the museum, it was very easy now for us to x-ray these mummies, much more so than it was in 2001 in the old museum. Next slide. We used regular x-ray film, as I mentioned, every day we transported the films to the hospital and they were kind enough to let us develop the films here. The films came out a little bit better because we had the higher output x-ray unit, not that old one from 2001. Next slide. So here's this is an example of what we found in 2008. So this is MM27. Uh, she is known as the elegant lady. She was approximately 60 years old when she, she died. Next slide. We can see the collar she wore, the metal collar. But what's really interesting here, she had arthritis. We can see it in her shoulder joint. She had calcified cervical lymph nodes in her neck. And she also had a calcified aortic arch. On the lateral skull, you can see there is obvious example of gum disease. She's lost all her teeth in her maxilla and a great number of her teeth in her mandible. Next slide. The chest x-ray <clears throat> gives us a better perspective of her calcified aorta but it also shows the extent of that arthritis that we first saw in her shoulder. Her hands are affected completely with arthritic changes. She has osteophytes or spurring on her thoracic spine. Next slide. In her lumbar spine, we're seeing that too, her other hand. Her right hip has some arthritic changes, but dramatically that left hip this x-ray is telling us she either had an old fracture, her femoral head is almost totally reabsorbed. She either had an old fracture there or something called avascular necrosis of that, that femoral head. So going back to Ron's bioarchaeology of care, this woman would not have been able to get around very well. And we determined that this condition took at least five years to develop for that, that left hip. Next slide. 
So it looks like her left leg is shorter than her right. And that's because of that condition with her hip. She is not walking on it. Because she is not walking on it, there's demineralization of the bone. If you don't put weight on the bone, then the body is going to absorb the calcium from the bone and the bone's going to be demineralized. She also has some arthritic changes uh, associated with her knee. Next slide. So in 2008, we examined 20 mummies. We're doing more mummies, but we did it in five days. We shot 200 x-rays over a 40 day uh, or 40 x-rays per day. Next slide. In 2009, uh, a number of mummies were brought to the Detroit Science Center in Detroit, Michigan. Next slide. So we got a little crazier. We attached the x-ray unit to the tines of a forklift truck. And by getting it almost four and a half meters off the ground, now the x-rays can cover the entire mummy. If we take x-rays with this distance, we can stitch all the x-rays together. So we have one x-ray stitched together of the entire mummy. Next slide. We had a much larger film cassette. We're still using film. And this uh, film cassette was 35.5 by 91 centimeters. And by sliding it in from the top, we could get the upper half of the body. And by jazzy sliding it in from the bottom, we can get the lower half of the body. Each cassette was, filmed, was filled with three sheets of film. So there would be six x-rays with two exposures of each mummy. Next slide. Because the mummies were on like a stretcher or a litter, we were able to lift them and also get lateral projections or side views. Next. Jazzy would transport uh, the x-rays twice a day, 20 kilometers to the Oak Royal Oak Veterinary Hospital in Michigan, and we would process the films there. Next. However, most significant while in Detroit, we were able to get CT scans. So here you're seeing Imad Hamin and Jim Jordan of Siemens, who scanned four mummies at the Oakwood Hospital and Medical Center in, in Dearborn, Michigan. So that's about 16 kilometers from the um, Detroit Science Center. Next slide. So what the CT unit does, it collects a volume of data. That volume of data can be sliced in a number of planes, such as axial, coronal, or sagittal. That data can be reassembled to create 3D images. And again, uh, you're looking at MM27, the elegant lady, and you can see the bandages wrapped around her hand and wrist. wrist. So there are algorithms built into the CT unit that allow us to manipulate the data to demonstrate something even like bandages or clothing. Next slide. So this really kind of shows you what the CT can do. So on the left side, you've got a lateral skull and an AP skull, but we could have a, a reconstructive algorithm that does superficial reconstruction. We can remove the skin, look at the bone and even remove parts of the bone. So here we're looking at the brain remnant at the back of the skull. Uh, on the lower half, you can see just a, a bone reconstruction uh, for that AP skull, or we can use an algorithm that will actually outline bits of the brain in the back of the skull after removing some of the bone. Next slide. So again, this is our elegant lady. We can see three different algorithms applied for her bone, putting some soft tissue on. 
those are aesthetically pleasing. It's really pretty. But what's important here, there's an axial section of her chest, and we can look at the extent of massive calcifications of her aortic arch. The other thing that is probably most significant on the axial section of the hip, we can see that that was a fracture to that hip and the femoral head over time gets absorbed. But the more beautiful image I think is below it where we can see bandages wrapped around her knees. Next slide. We also did a CT on MH27, the minor. To the, to the right, you can see we've not stitched together. We could stitch them together, but I wanted you to see how the images overlay when we take in the x-rays from a great height. <clears throat> These are the six x-rays of the minor assembled. Next slide. And on the x-rays, we can see what looks like a possible fracture on the left side of the skull. There are some fragments in the back of the skull inside. It looks like there's some cervical spines missing. You can also see bad, probably gum disease, lost most of his teeth. Next slide. On the CT scan, first the axial section it shows that bit of bone in the back of the skull and on the coronal section clearly demonstrates the fracture that was only suggested on the x-ray. Next slide. He's got a calcification of a mediastinal uh, lymph node in his chest. That could be suggestive of tuberculosis or some other disease. We can see that loose cervical vertebrae there in the right side of his chest. On the 3D reconstruction, beautiful demonstration of that cervical spine. And there are multiple um, calcifications within the dried up lung tissue on that axial section. So we can see much more on the CT scan than we can see on the plain x-ray. Next. This is a 3D image, once again, the multiple calcifications within the desiccated lung tissue, that calcified uh, mediastinal node, that cervical spine. So this almost looks like a photograph of a skeleton and not a medical image. Next slide. Important on this guy, we can see that his left hip was also fractured and this is probably a much older fracture, probably more than five years old. And there's actually changes to the joint. On the plain film, you can see that, but it's really beautifully demonstrated on that axial section where you can see that the bone is just destroyed from absorption. He's definitely not mobile. Going back to Ron's bioarchaeology of care, this is not someone who would have got around really easy. Someone had to help take care of this individual through his life, which I think is really important. A lot of times we forget that the amount of love and caring that probably went in to take care of these individuals during this period, there is no way this person was able to completely take care of themselves. Next slide. Because of the disuse of that left leg, we've got that demineralization of his left leg, and you can see it in his ankle and his foot. There's much higher degree of mineralization in his right leg because he probably is weight-bearing on the right leg, but there is no way he's weight-bearing on that left. Next slide. So in 2009 in Detroit, we x-rayed 18 mummies in three days. 108 films, about 36 films per day. Next. In 2016, we returned to Guanajuato, but this was a game changer for sure because we brought with us this time equipment provided to us by CubTech, uh, X-ray Equipment Manufacturer in Connecticut. Not only did they provide the equipment, but they provide uh, 
a doctor of physics to come along with us to operate the equipment to maximize our results. Next slide. So in this trip, uh, I had a student, Ed Borman, Dr. Chester Lowe was from Cub Tech. You can see Chester there in a couple of the shots. And Ariana Thomas uh, assisted Ron in the endoscopy. Next slide. So we had learned a lot between 2001 and 2016. First of all, it was really significant to have the digital equipment there. So on the, in the left panel, you can see the digital plate on the floor covered in plastic. And there are two pieces of duct tape sticking on either side so we could drag this plate up and down the floor. Uh, Miguel had a table built for us that was radiolucent so we could move the mummy over it. For the AP, the vertical radiographs, we built this aluminum frame and there are wheels at the bottom so that we can roll it down the length of the table without having to move the mummy. Next slide. For our lateral projections, unfortunately, because we only had one x-ray unit, we had to lift the x-ray tube off the aluminum frame and do a horizontal beam. Next. The beauty of the digital radiography, it doesn't need a dark room. Next. But it has a very wide latitude. You could set just about anything on that x-ray unit and the image is gonna be fantastic. Next. So here's a comparison, not the same mummy, but you can, you can get the idea of the differences. So the conventional x-ray that we shot in Detroit, high output x-ray tube, but we're still not seeing soft tissue very well. If you take a look at the digital image that we acquired in 2016, I can see bones fantastic. I can see soft tissue around the neck. I can see the trachea, the tracheal rings. I can see soft tissue structures. So I'm seeing everything here that I would not be able to see on the conventional x-ray film. Next. The other thing that's important about this, after the image is acquired, you can manipulate it. You can change the contrast, the density. So this is like playing in Photoshop. It's digitally recorded. So if we wanted to ask a radiologist in Egypt what they thought about a particular x-ray, in the past, we would have to send the x-ray to them or photograph it. Now we can electronically send the x-ray to anyone in the world for a diagnosis by consensus. We can send it to two, three radiologists and get everyone's opinion and then finally decide on, uh, on what their conclusions are. Next. Okay, so some examples of what we got out of 2016. Next. There were a number of dental problems. Um, and I'll move through this fairly quickly. You, we come up with an age and you can see that it went everywhere from having no teeth to some teeth, a lot of dental uh, gum disease. Uh, in that last image, MH14, that was 20 to 30 years old, you can see that there are actually fillings in the teeth in an impacted third molar. Again, incredible contrast on these digital images. Next. A lot of arthritic changes, something that you would expect where there may be a lot of physical labor, arthritis in the shoulder, arthritis in the cervical neck, and um, arthritis with these uh, osteophytes in the thoracic spine. Next. We saw evidence of trauma. The one on the left, MM63, the 60 year old female, you can see that there's an old fracture of the tibia fibula. Again, I don't know if that would have been able to be determined on regular x-ray film. And we're also seeing the uh, Harris's lines 
on that femur. So this individual, even though they're 60 years old at the time of their death, there's still some evidence that they may have had problems with disease or lack of food uh, in their childhood. Uh, next. There's evidence that there was possibly tuberculosis, which isn't surprising. We're seeing calcified lymph nodes uh, on MH1 and uh, calcified mediastinal uh, lymph nodes on uh, MM11. Next. We're seeing calcifications of the arteries, atherosclerosis on MM54. And what's, again, interesting, I don't think we could have caught this on regular x-ray film, is it looks like there's an inflamed gallbladder on MM53. Next. I thought this was extremely interesting. We're seeing some evidence of medical care. Uh, MM43, it looks like that individual had a thoracotomy to remove part of the lung. And there is also evidence, although I didn't point it out on the slide, of calcified lymph nodes in the chest. So this individual probably had tuberculosis and then had uh, surgery to remove the lung, a procedure that was common in the past. On MM40, that's injection of either mercury or bismuth. The radiologist who looked at this trained in Columbia, and I'm not sure if a physician in the United States would have picked this up, but uh, he said he had seen radiographs from the 1940s, 1950s, where this was a procedure done in Columbia. Next. Probably the most interesting aspect, this was not planned because of the resolution that we were able to get on these um, digital radiographs, we started looking at shoes. Next. And on these three individuals, you can see that the shoes are markedly different. Now, my task is to get really good x-rays. Now it's going to be up to the team in Guanajuato to go into how shoe construction changed over time. But it's also, but you're also able to assess um, the, the health of the feet. So on MM16, that individual that's a 50 to 60 year old female, you can see there's spurring on, on the calcaneus. So that must have been slightly painful on with that individual's feet. Next. This is the most spectacular uh, result that we have. We looked at 44 mummies in four days. We shot 355 images or 89 x-rays per day using the digital format. Next. Muchas gracias a todos. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias, Ron. Gracias, Jerry. Y gracias a todos ustedes, compañeros, estudiantes. Uh, so, el presentación de, de Ron es una presenta, presentación de bioarqueología en, en general. El presentación de, de Jerry es de uh, aplicación de, de este tipo de uh, estudio sobre, sobre el, el, el colección de momias de aquí en Guanajuato. Mi presentación y la presentación de mi estudiante Tigan es para, para e explorar cómo estudiar, cómo est podemos eh, estudiar eh, momias en otras otro, uh, 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 situaciones y también qué podemos hacer con la información que ganamos sobre los momias para presentar por el público. So, 
¿cómo estudiamos uh, momias en otro uh, uh, contexto? Tradicionalmente, el, el, uh, el forma de estudio, estudio momias es, es para, para uh, disolver y uh, 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 disequeamos. Okay? Y ese es un ejemplo de, 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 uh, del el siglo XIX en, en Egipto, la próxima. Y este tipo de estudios es, es bien informativo, puede ver todas las los, uh, informaciones sobre tejidos y, y tatuajes y otras cosas, pero es bien destru, 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 destructivo. Este, el, el resto es del Romeo en, en Toronto, después un, una sesión uh, 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 de disección, pero y, también mucha información, pero eh, ahora es, el momia es, es, es en pedazos. Okay. So, mejor es para uh, uh, proceder como uh, Ron y Jerry y usamos el otro tipo de investigaciones. Y uh, ejemplo aquí fue en qué año es, es 2014 en, en, en Ecuador con Ron, Jerry y yo y, y Miguel, uh, uh, fuimos en, uh, uh, en Ecuador con una colección de, de momias de, de Perú y este momias son en, 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 en fardos, en paquetes de, de tejidos y el, el hombre fue adentro y primero vamos por, por tomar fotos, tomar ex, rayos X y después con un cuatro momias to, tomamos uh, CT scans. So, normalmente los estudios de, de momias son uh, estudios de caso. So, este es un ejemplo de, de mi primer momia. Es una momia en, en una ciudad bien cerca de, de mi ciudad en, en Ontario. Y uh, so, we, it, 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 tomamos uh, con Ron y Jerry en 2001, pienso. Uh, tomamos uh, uh, placas y después tomamos un, un CT scan, y, pero realmente uh, conocemos solo un poco de, de contexto original. Es el, el caso, en muchos casos de, de los momias de Egipto, no, no conocemos su, su contexto original. So, en, en este, uh, no, yeah, so, so, es, es un buen ejemplo de estudio de en, un, en uno individuo, pero no realmente no conocemos mucho más sobre la sociedad de, de Egipto. So, por nosotros, el reto es cómo podemos estudiar más momias. Queremos mover, pas, pasar eh, 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 estudios de caso para estudios como de, de poblaciones. So, un, un posibilidad es para crear una uh, base de datos de estudios de momias y este es un proyecto de, de, de yo en, en mi universidad, universidad. Es una colección de CTs y, y x de, de momias de Egipto y es en, en, es en un computador y podemos, uh, 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 tenemos uh, datos por más de 100 momias. Y este, este, uh, este uh, base de datos facilita uh, ocho tesis de graduado, ocho artículos y mucho más uh, uh, presentaciones y, y conferencias. Y eso es un sistema de yo poner mis datos primero en, en el, el base de datos y solicitar los uh, 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 casos de otros museos y últimamente. Y, y últimamente podemos uh, 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 proveer los, los uh, estudios por, por cualquier uh, 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 bioarqueólogo que quiere ver. So este es, es, es un base de datos para, para el, todos los, los bombes de Egipto en el mundo. Este es un pro, proyecto que hacemos en, en Perú, en el sitio de Pachacamac, en el centro costa, centro, costa central de Perú. Es un gran sitio de, de uh, peregrinación y administración del de, de centro costa central. Y la próxima. Y en 2020, eh, 2000, 
2015. Uh, hay exhibiciones en el sitio, no sorpresa, hay exhibiciones en el sitio de uh, arqueología, encontrar un cementerio. Y este es un ejemplo de una colección, una tumba de, de, de fardos. Y es, es, este fue una preparación por un nuevo uh, museo. Y la fecha es de uh, más, más de mil, uh, 100 años hasta 1047. Y este, este momio son, son fardos. So, so es, es un paquete de textiles. Um, y adentro es, es uh, artefactos y, y el individuo es en una posición fraccionada uh, adentro. Y estos son paquetes, son información cultural y bio, bi, biológica de, de los uh, uh, hombres de, 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 de este tiempo. Y por nosotros este paquete son microcosmos. So, es con, con, contenían el, el información biológica y cultural. So, nuestro sistema, que es, es un, un desarrollar del sistema de Ron y Jerry, y primero tenemos una uh, gran colección de, de fardos, eh, examinamos uh, esta colección con, con, con ojos y, y, y fotos, tomamos uh, radiográficos de, de, de muestro de estos y uh, solo pocos, bueno, well, más de pocos, pero uh, con, uh, po poner por el, el CT scan. So, es un proceso de selección. Y uh, placas de, de, placas de, de Ron y, y Jerry tiene, podemos ver uh, lo que ellos tienen adentro, pero este es un poquito, poquito más complicado. Uh, por, por un parte porque el, el, eh, eh, y muchas veces el esqueleto es, es un poco mezclado pero eh, eh, las cosas biológico podemos ver lo mismo cosa de, de, de Jerry y problemas dental uh, podemos ver que ese es un cráneo masculino podemos ver el, el estado de fusión de, de los huesos es, es un adulto próximo Um, en, en la preparación del de, de, de el, el cuerpo por, por eh, entierro, eh, es, la posición es importante, uh, flexión, y los tex, textiles, un montón de tex, textiles, pero, pero también algodón con semillas. Y los artefactos, so, eh, eh, cosas metales, láminas metales. Este es un disco redondo de metal, son doblado, siempre. Uh, uh, hablamos con este con un taco um, y el, el uh, espondles y eso es, es un, los, los cosas de cultural y bio, biológico contenemos en es un microcosmo so, en total hasta ahora tenemos uh, uh, 56 uh, uh, CT scans de este, tenemos más de 80 uh, uh, rayos X. Este es el clínica en Lima. Y este es un, un video. So, con CT podemos uh, usar el, 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 el beneficio importante de CT, es, es, es podemos ver en tres dimensiones. Las placas son importantes, pero las tres dimensiones son hasta dos dimensiones. So, So en, en, en el CT puede ver en, en tres dimensiones, puede, puede, eh, puede ver los, los varios vistas de, de, de los, uh, del esqueleto y ta también podemos uh, seleccionar un poquito uh, 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 componentes específicamente. En este ejemplo es el cráneo y podemos ver el, el cráneo en, 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 en más detalle. Y con este hablamos sobre el osteobiografía es, es, es la historia de la vida de este individuo As, eh, podemos ver en sus huesos o uh, si hay, hay, hay tejidos blandos en este, es, eh, esta información también so, un ejemplos como, como Jerry uh, en, en esta colección hay mucha uh, uh, deformación craneal y uh, este es, 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 no hay mucho, pero este es, es, es el, 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 el uh, platismo, flattening. Yeah. ¿Cómo? ¿A plato? Aplanado. 
gracias. <risa> es, es extremo en este, es, este caso. Y es, es una forma de modificación uh, 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 étnica. So, probablemente tenemos varios grupos étnicos en esta colección. Y también um, otra modificación corporal. Tenemos un, un, un ejemplo. Su, su mano es... es, 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 es uh, 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 Outside, afuera de, 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 de su faro y puede ver el, el, el tatuaje y los artefactos los, los bienes culturales son, son bien importantes este grupo no es, no es muy rico pero algunos de estos el, el, el spondylus es, es un, un, uh, uh, un uh, artefacto importante y las cosas metales son importantes y este, este individuo es, es un ejemplo de, de, de violencia, uh, probablemente violencia en, 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 en el, el uh, contexto uh, uh, ritual. Uh, este fue, fue, fue fallecido con, con el club y es, este es su, su, no es en posición flexionada, es en posición con su, su cara debajo, como así. So es un ejemplo excepcional de violencia en este grupo. So, en resumen, <coughs> utilizamos el este, sistema de Ron y Jerry y bioarqueología con uh, las imágenes no sin destructivo para ver qué pasa con la población y, y we, probablemente hay varios grupos étnicos. Um, es, 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 es un, eh, podemos poner en, en su posición en, en temporal en la costa central y este grupo es, es un grupo a veces en cementerios en Perú hay, hay seleccionando por, por los, los, uh, los niños ahí o, o, o adultos ahí pero este grupo es, es un grupo con todos los, los edades y sexos y en cosa interesante no, no cuando es, es eh, eh, comer, pero es que estos son en un en estado uh, de, de des, avanzado de descomposición. So, el la, 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 uh, uh, sistema mortuario es, es pro, prolongado y la, de, de, hay, hay muchas posibilidades por insectos y otras cosas para accesar los cuerpos. Ok, y ese uh, indica que los artefactos son, you know, algunos de, de importantes, pero no es un, un, un grupo muy rico. So, ya, yeah, este es como indica de la presencia de varios grupos étnicos. So, la idea es, es este ejemplo, uh, demostrar las cosas que hablamos con, con Ron y Jerry, y los, los utilizamos las técnicas de bio, bioarqueología y uh, 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 el sistema de uh, 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 no destructivo y los bombis son microcosmos o en este, este ejemplo son microcosmos de, de, de su, su cultura estos son un microcosmo también ¿ya? y <coughs> Hay varias cosas, eh, eh, los, los, el cementerio puede dar información sobre el, el grupo más, más uh, grande y es, es un, importante para entender la, los, los culturas de la cent, costa central. Ok. Right. Ok. So, esta parte, so, es, el último parte es, es el, mi trabajo ahora estoy trabajando sobre el, el trabajo de, de Tigel. Tigel es, en, uh, uh, es elaborando su tesis ma maestría en cómo podemos, cómo podemos demostrar nuestra uh, uh, información sobre los grupos que tienen interés. So, esta es movilización de conocimiento, es el, 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 el término de que. So, ¿Cuál es? Uh, movilización de, de conocimiento es, es para transformar eh, la información sobre los, los 
bioarqueólogos, por ejemplo, para el público o para el estudiantes o por otros grupos. Y en, la cosa importante en este caso es cómo podemos usar los huesos humanos o momias uh, en este caso, en, en, en este proceso. Y <coughs> tenemos que eh, eh, interpretar las los experiencias de vida de, de los muertos, de los esqueletos humanos como personas, ¿no? E, y que, que queremos tra transmitir esta información al público en general. So, la, la historia es de, de Tigen. Es, es para determinar cuál es, eh, cuál es el sistema de varios profesionales y, y en museos en varias uh, partes del mundo uh, para, para, para comunicar sobre los, los uh, bombas u, u esqueletos para el público. Y durante el tiempo de, de, de uh, uh, COVID, es sobre Zoom, Uh, entrevisto a 16 profesionales y en Gran Bretaña y en, en Canadá y Estados Unidos y tiene un eh, estudio de caso con el, el museo en Pachacamac. Y los temas eh, es, no hay solo, solo un sistema perfecto. ¿no? Hay varios, varios uh, 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 um, modos de comunicar y la cosa importante es el contexto del de, de museo, ¿ya? Le, le, el contexto cultural del museo y también de audiencia. Y últimamente la, la, la cosa importante es el impacto, qué, qué podemos, uh, uh, qué podemos uh, comunicar las cosas lo más importante para la audiencia. Y una cosa interesante que digan descubrir es que los museos tienen un, un, un papel muy importante en comunicar la información sobre el inter, intermediarios, intermediarios del conocimiento. En inglés es knowledge brokers. So, eh, la, la, eh, 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 la información Uh, 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 ponen el, por el centro el, el museo y el museo puede uh, uh, jugar un papel en uh, uh, redirectar la información por el, el audiencias diferentes. Um, so, yeah, so, so, la cosa importante es el, el contexto para in, 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 entender el, el contexto de, de los museos y también las diferentes uh, personas que tienen interés. So, um, y, y, y cosas importantes sobre temas es que necesito usar el lenguaje preciso y apropiada por la audiencia. So, so no podemos usar uh, todas las uh, palabras de médicos para, para la audiencia uh, de pública general. ¿no? So, es, es importante ajustar. Y ejemplos que bueno, que pensamos son buenos, es, es, es el, el sitio de red de, de Tierra Ósea. Con, con mucha información sobre eh, 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 que eh, acompañan las los fotos. El contexto es un poco diferente aquí, y es un buen ejemplo de necesita uh, entender los contextos diferentes. ¿no? Es un ejemplo en, en Pachacamac, en, en Perú. Uh, este es un grupo de niños uh, y el, el, los, los uh, empleados del museo son utilizando los fardos y, y esqueletos para comunicar la los, los, uh, 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 información que ganamos en, en nuestro trabajo por los niños. Y el otro es, es una uh, 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 exhibición del de, Ultimatamente, el Museo Británico, ahora es en el Museo Bozart en Montreal, para viajando por el mundo. 
Pero esa exhibición es, es, es particularmente bueno porque hay, tiene su momia, tiene su, su, su CT scans, tiene su información sobre, sobre contexto y el, el, el público puede in, in, interac, interactuar ¿ya? Con, con los CT scans, con, con controls, puede, puede modificar el, el CT scan. Um, <coughs> So, cosas bien importantes es, es, es el contexto, ¿no? So, en, 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 en su, su sitio de web, en, en, en para poner el, el contexto de los momias de aquí. Y la, la idea es, es, es estos son momias son personas, ¿no? Es, es, son, son, y, y son, no son, son uh, uh, objetos u otras cosas, son personas, ¿no? Y esa es una cosa bien importante. So, la sensibilidad es import, importante en, en este proceso de comunicación y también colaboración. Este es un eh, ejemplo de Ron y Jerry y en, en los Filipinos, Filipinos, Filip, Filipinas, y es, este es una un, uh, momia de tiempo moderna y este es una un, uh, 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 familia de, de este ejemplo. So, es un, un proceso de colaboración, no solo con, con el, 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 el grupo general, pero específicamente con la familia. Y so, it, yeah, it, 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 necesito poner en el contexto de comunidad, pero también con, con la familia. So, una cosa bien importante con este tipo de trabajo es el, el contexto et, ética. Y es, este es un, un cosa lo más importante es que necesito entender el contexto local. Y porque los, los, los sistemas éticos son un poquito diferentes en las, las partes diferentes del mundo. En Canadá, el, el, el fenómeno de, de, de poner exposición de restos humanos es, es muy diferente de aquí. And so, la, la, la cosa bien importante es entender el contexto. Y posiblemente el, el sistema puede, puede cambiar. Y en, en Norteamérica, en, en, en Estados Unidos y, y en Canadá, es, es en, en proceso de, de cambiando. Ok. So, temas en general de, de estos, ojalá, son juntos, es... es las fotografías de aquí son, son ejemplos importantes que, que el otro tipo de trabajo que, que hacemos es, estos son personas, ¿no? So, con las placas, con los CT scans, es, estamos, el concepto de osteobiografía, la, la idea es para, para hablar sobre la historia de su vida. Um, y los, los diferentes tipos de trabajo, el, el, el rayos X y endoscopia, y, y, y so, fotografías es, es son el, el parte de encima de, de individuo, so, los rayos X y uh, uh, endoscopia o CT scans puede ver adentro, es, es, es vista diferente. Y con, con, con este tipo de, de información puede leer las osteobiografías de este individuo. And so, como, so in, in su vida, es la osteobiografía, pero también podemos ver si tratemos en, en la muerte, cómo, cómo tratar en preparación por, por entierro. And, um, y la presentación de Jerry demostró el, el, cam, el cambio bien importante en, en tecnología que podemos uh, uh, aplicar en este, este caso. Y ahora tenemos las, las placas digitales, es, es magnífico. Y Ron, el, el importante concepto de, de Ron es el diagnóstico de, de consenso. No, es, 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 no, no, yo no tengo todos los, los, uh, los, los uh, 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 answers. ¿Cómo? Les prestas, ya. Muchas preguntas. Pero, <laughs> so, pero eh, eh, necesito un, un, un grupo ¿ya? con diferente tipo de, de experiencia y, eh, y uh, uh, especialidades. 
y últimamente es este, este grupo de, de, de momias de aquí es, es en, 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 en colección bien, bien importante. Por muchas veces hay una gran, gran cantidad de individuos en, en su, su uh, colección. Es importante en comparación, comparación sobre los, los uh, 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 estudios de casos. ¿no? Tiene un grupo. Y um, hay muchos tipos de información que tiene ustedes aquí. Tiene, tiene archivos, tiene fotos, tiene rayos X, scans, tiene el contexto de, de cementerio. So, y, y, de todos juntos son bien importantes. Y, y tiene un registro de, de cómo se, 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 se están tratando en, en el muerto, pero tan, también tenemos... Eh, 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 conocemos mucho de, de su, su, su vida, si sí, la idea es para combinar. Y estas momias son un reflejo sobre la comunidad de desarrollo de, de Guanajuato. Sí. Eh, estos son embajadores, pensamos de, de embajadores, so, no son uh, objetos, son personas. Uh, Personas que vivieron, amaron, murieron, son microcosmos de su vida. Ese es un, un, una uh, cotación uh, uh, de, de su, 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 su website. Contrario a la fu fugacidad de los espejos, el cuerpo árido es, es tangible, ¿no? podemos ver el, el, el hombre. So, ellos tienen historias para, para, para contar y la, la, el papel importante por nosotros es para ayudarnos a contar sus historias. Ok, gracias a todos. Y para, este es su amigo Miguel en, en uh, Quito. And, uh, gracias a todo el grupo de aquí. Y uh, mi, mi compañero es de el, mi, mi equipo de movimientos como Microcosmos y el Museo Pachacamac por financiamiento. Gracias. <ríe> y por supuesto, gracias a los movimientos. Sí, no, hay, no, no, no podemos hablar nada sin, sin ellos. So, gracias. Disculpa por mi Spanglish. <risa> bueno, eh, gracias por asistir a esta ponencia. Eh, me gustaría dar eh, lugar a algún espacio para preguntas, si tuvieran. Nosotros, si las hacen en español o en inglés, y si las hacen en español, podemos traducirlas también hacia nuestros ponentes que están... Eh, en línea. No sé si haya preguntas por aquí. Ok. ¿Qué hay, Gaby? A ver, dámelas. Okay. Um, espera. Ok. Ahora... I have to ask, uh, guys in the Zoom meeting, are you listening to us? If you can answer in your meeting chat, please. <laughs> Ese va a ser el problema para contestar. Okay. Bueno. Um, what's your view? Okay. Um, It's in general, so maybe you can answer, Andrew. Um, what's your view for the future of the studies with mummies? <laughs> so, so the question is, what is the view for the future of mummy studies? Um, that's a very good question that has a lot to do with the, the ethic status that, that, that we talked about. Um, and I think the, the, the future of mummy studies really could be here. 
you know, I, I, I think this is a, a great place to, to, to use as a great example of, of where you have all these different kinds of information together um, and, and, and uh, we can pull them all together, you know, work with the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Mexican authorities to really tell the stories of these individuals as a group, both as individuals and as a group. Um, and, and to be this amazing combination of the different kinds of, of information that we have. Um, but I think, you know, in, 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 I alluded to in, in, North, in uh, uh, the United States and in Canada, um, mummy studies, at least insofar as it's being presented in museums, is becoming more and more difficult to do. Um, I can do it with my database. Um, and I can do it when I go to Peru, and I, th I think, uh, you know, the, the, the future there with increasing technology, increasing ability to use non-destructive imaging to get more and more kinds of information, I think that's really where the future is. Any of you guys in, in this meeting would like to answer about the future of the mummy studies? Wait, wait, Ron, wait. Particularly in, in some areas like North America. <clears throat> but I hope that we've talked through this, uh, as we've talked through this, I, I, and I, I wish uh, uh, more people could, could understand the intent and purpose behind mummy studies, as, as we've talked, as all of you are aware, and as we've talked about today, um, yes, pulling in more experts, yes, adding more technology, but also the knowledge mobilization uh, that Andrew and Tegan discussed, discussed is really critical for um, populations outside of very narrow interested parties like academics and researchers and medical physicians to understand what can be learned to create an empathy for the human journey on earth. And I think with only with that understanding, and I think that's a real focus of where mummy studies has to go, is to uh, make the information palatable. Some of the talk today was, was quite technical about um, bone spur on a calcaneus. And, and what does that mean to, to most folks? Well, if we can slowly introduce that, I think more people will probably embrace what we can do and then marry that in those places where we can advance studies, like in Mexico and, and South America, where we can advance these studies uh, and continue to get that information, not only to the scientific academic community, but get it to the general population in a way that they understand that it's, it's not voyeuristic, it's important. Um, the, these people maybe want to speak to us from the past, and, and I, I am hoping that in the future, my view would be that, that we could uh, amplify that aspect of, of mummy scientists. And again, as this, oh man, every, every year, every six months, technology improves and advances and improves the, the way in which we can gather non-destructive data. And more medical professionals are now uh, interested and, and, and well-trained in reviewing um, imaging from 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 um, <clears throat> from mummified and, and desiccated human remains. So I think it is slowly advancing, very slowly, in the ten in terms of the professional study. But also, I think we need to do a good job of getting this information out there. The Tierra Osea exhibit is a phenomenal example of exactly what I'm talking about: is to bring the the reality of these people's lives to the common public, to the public, so that the, the, and the media can understand that th this is a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal effort on part of the researchers, phenomenal effort on part of, 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 of the Tierra Osea uh, project there in, in Guanajuato. Thank you. Sorry, this is tricky. Okay, I have a question to Jerry. So, um, about the elegant lady. Um, from what era will, will the elegant lady 
will be considered in what year. Jerry? <laughs> I, I'm not sure Jerry is there, but I think the better answer that may come from, from Miguel and his research team who have put together a really good uh, background um, of most of these, uh, most of these individuals. And um, uh, I don't know, I think I saw Miguel out there. Hola, Miguel. And that, uh, <laughs> Uh, some of his research may be able to add, add more light on when that person uh, uh, dis what became deceased. Okay. Okay. Next, Gaby, hay otra pregunta? Okay, we have one question here. Um, I do not know who is going to ask this question, but was there any specific mommy here in Guanajuato that gave you like more context of the period that the person lived, like for any specific circumstances in the mummification process, it give you any specific information that was like awesome or something like that? Again, uh, Jerry's not there, so let me, let me chime in. I think that um, you all know the environment there in Guanajuato, and uh, you know, all probably know a lot about the history of, of disease patterns in the area. So I, I, I really think that some of the cases that Jerry presented collectively start to give us a good picture of, of life in Guanajuato. Um, true, the mummification quality of individuals' mummies that we have studied has, has varied, but it gives us a nice longitudinal view of, of life in perhaps the mid to late 1800s and early 1900s and into the middle of the 1900s there in Guanajuato. In that, it's sometimes a difficult environment to navigate, cobblestone streets. I understand that it's raining there or it has rained today. Uh, those cobblestones get slippery, slippery. So we have hip fractures. We understand that tuberculosis and diseases were rampant. This validates, uh, validates those reports. The calcifications of, of arteries uh, that Jerry showed in some of his cases and the severe arthritis of the elegant woman uh, she was perhaps one of the most fantastic uh, cases, I think, if we had to select one, because she had a combination of those um, characteristic diseases, perhaps tubercul tuberculosis, uh, um, orthopedic situation like arthritis, aortic stenosis, that any elderly person would have. It, back to the bioarchaeology bio of care, she was cared for. She lived a long life. Um, so I think she may be, to me anyway, one that stands out is not only speaking to the, the times, but also to the spirit of Guanajuato in those times and the caring community that it obviously was and continues to be. Okay, thank you, Ron. We have another question for Andrew. The question is, it is more important to first have uh, studies about a mummified body before its exposition or display? I'm not I'm sure, not sure. I would say that there has to be an order. Um, certainly many of the Egyptian mummies that, that I look at uh, have been on display for a hundred years. Um, and so the fact that they've ha been on display doesn't take away from what we can learn from them. Um, I think just the fact is that, that, that we do try to learn from them. We use the techniques that we have available. The key difference between 
these mummies and a lot of the Egyptian mummies that, that I work on is we don't know about the original context. Um, you know, in the late 1800s, there was a huge mummy trade and lots of mummies were being shipped out of Egypt all around the world and we don't know where they originally came from. So I can study them as individuals, but I can't study them within the context of where they came from, which is exactly what Ron was just talking about in terms of understanding these people within the context of, of Guanajuato. So I, I, I don't, so the answer to the question is I don't, I don't think there's a, a, a time before or after where, where they should be studied, as long as they are studied and, and as long as, you know, as they're part of expositions that, that the, 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 the fruits of those studies be incorporated into the presentations. What do you think about the way the mummies are displayed today in Guanajuato? Is it correct or uh, do you think there is another way to make it more uh, important, like tra treating them like humans? <laughs> um, so I've, I've only seen the museum once, so I will qualify what I say by that. Um, I did not get the sense that they were being treated in the way that if, if I was to think about doing that, 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 that museum, um, that, that I would think that they should be treated. You know, at, at the last two bullets of my presentation is these people have stories to tell and we should be telling them. Um, you know, Tegan studies knowledge mobilization and one of the things that really struck us about that museum is that there's very little in terms of actual mo mobilization. And so we see the mummies, but we don't know the stories. And, and, and as I understand it, the stories are, are there, and perhaps not perfect stories for every individual, but the, the you know, general stories. And then I, I think there could be a much more effective combination of, of the work that Ron and Jerry have done with, with the actual mummies themselves. You know, as speaking as a bioarchaeologist, that's really what I would like to see is, is, is that material brought together um, and, and sort of better contextualization of the mummies. Gaby, ¿tenemos más preguntas o ya acabamos? Okay, wait. <laughs> like La Estrangurada case, I mean, uh, strangled. What's your opinion when museums lies, up, lies about their mis mummies for cause sensation? Maybe this also can answer Ron? Yes, I think Ron would be the best. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Ready. Ready? Okay. Yeah, that's a very, very important question. And this is true not only uh, in the direct question there for the strangled person, but it's true for objects like the baboon that I showed. It's, it's, it's not real, and yet the information that suggests it's not real is in a totally different place in the museum. So you have to find it to understand. So <laughs> museums walk a fine line in appealing to the public to get them to come in. I think now, based on this two decades of work and tacking on to what Andrew said, I think personally that there's a depth of information on many of these individuals and it's something Uh, maybe limited, like no, the person wasn't strangled. But that's what should be. That's what should be there. We know that now. So museums had a story because it, they were basing that on the information they had, the appearance of the the marks on the neck. Ooh, could have been a rope. It turned out it was uh, la ropa, the clothes. <laughs> it was. Um, but now that we know that, the stories really, really should evolve. The story should really change. The evidence, the science, um, the, the data 
is really what should drive any presentation in, in any museum. I, I hope that answers your question. And, and so maybe, maybe let me quickly add to, um, I, I don't know how aware a lot of you are about uh, Miguel and his team's work on researching these specific individuals. It's, it's phenomenal. It, the depth is, is amazing. So in the photographic presentation in Tierra Osea is, is a step in the right direction, I think, for telling these people's stories. Um, I believe there needs to be a marriage of the science and the visual inspiration, the visual wow factor of seeing this individual, to look into the face and their eyes, but knowing their story makes them, makes them real. So that would be my vote. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Ron. Um, Andrew, would you like to answer some of the tricky question? Sure. I think part of the way Ron answered that was, was really good. Is it, is it, you know, certainly museums want to tell a story of, of the things in, the, in their collection. And that's what I'm, what I'm talking about, you know, the osteobiography. We're talking about telling the story. And, and I think, you know, certainly that particular individual, it looks like there's compression around the throat. And, and so, uh, you know, uh, perhaps, that's perhaps a little extreme for a story, but, but it's not an unreasonable place to start. But the trick is, there now is information that shows that that story is not true. And, and so I, th I think the important thing then is that the museum combines, you know, that can, make, that can actually be an important part of the discussion of that individual. Here is the original interpretation then there was the scientific study conducted, and now we have this different interpretation, right? So, and, and, and I, th I think, uh, you know, whatever is in the museums ultimately should be grounded in some sort of fact, whether that is arch arch archival fact or, or the, the fact that, that Ron and Jerry are seeing on their x-rays or their endoscopy. Um, whatever is being presented should be the best possible factual representation of what we know, not just stories that are made up to appeal to the public. Perfect. Uh, I think that's, that was our last question. So um, I'm going to switch to Espanol. <laughs> Sorry. Wait. Okay. Muchas gracias por asistir a esta conferencia. Eh, creo que esta conferencia llevamos años queriendo mostrarla aquí y estamos muy felices por realmente que la gente asistiera, que la gente también nos esté viendo y tener el apoyo también de las personas que están haciendo sus ponencias y creer en, en esta exposición también. Y por otro lado, por parte del Comité Organizador de las Jornadas Académicas sobre la Muerte en la Universidad de Guanajuato, la Exposición Fotográfica Tierra Ósea y la Compañía Lanzando Lázaros, queremos agradecer y entregar las constancias, eh, bueno, virtual a Ronald Beckett y a, y a Jerry Conlock, y presencialmente a Andrew Nelson por su importante e interesante ponencia. Muchas gracias a todos. Y Jerry acaba de anunciar que perdió conexión. Over here. <laughs> uh, on the screen. It's okay. For you. Yes. <laughs>